Hello everybody, how are you doing? This is Mauer Doctor here for another review. Uh, when you first saw the title of this video, I bet you were expecting something like a top 10 countdown or a duel-like battle between products to see which one can fight its way to the top. Well, I put this video together to help shed some light on the confusion that is very widespread online. There is one fact that is so powerful that there is no rebuttal that can produce a convincing enough argument to support. It is that there never will be such a thing as a best of anything. So I hope that most of the regular visitors to my channel know that there can never be such a thing as a perfect antivirus. And honestly, so long as there's competition between software vendors, there will be continued innovation to give their products a leading edge and the benefits are ultimately passed along to the consumer in the end. So maybe it's a good thing that there is no such thing as a best antivirus. But regardless, if my opinions are not convincing enough, let me share six reasons that there can never exist a best antivirus. The first reason that I decided to focus on was memory usage. So nearly all antiviruses and anti-malware applications have minimum system requirements to run their software on your computers. And this exists for a reason. In the beginning of nearly all of my antivirus tests, I display on Task Manager the amount of RAM and CPU that an antivirus consumes through the services and processes that are required to run the antivirus. So on an older machine running with, let's say, a Pentium 2 processor, and 512 megabytes of RAM is going to naturally run slower than a newer machine with a Core i7 processor and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So the same antivirus is put on both of these very different machines and as a result the differences between performance can be very noticeable. So some antiviruses can cause computers to experience slowdowns not only when running scheduled scans but just in the normal everyday use of a computer. So it's something very important to keep in mind, especially if you have under like one or two gigabytes of RAM. And even if you have eight gigabytes of RAM, it can still be somewhat noticeable when you're browsing a computer if the antivirus is taking up a considerable amount of memory. The second item that I wanted to focus on was the technical support that would be offered by the security software in the licensing agreement. So how many times have we seen highly priced applications advertised the benefits of using an advanced deluxe or any title with that variation for that matter that put a really high value on technical support? So it's a very common thing to offer as they generally acquire the money up front when you purchase the license and they're offering you the service in the event that you have a malware infection or some other technical difficulties. But seriously, technical support can be one of the biggest ripoffs if you do not read the terms of the agreement. Or the fact that a good percentage of the people that use the software never get infected at all while using it and they don't have to go back on the technical support that they were promised in the license agreement. Sometimes you can be redirected to a sub page or a sub website of their main page that will require additional payment for other services that might not be covered under their general technical support. So surprisingly, most of these paid security software sites have free forums that anyone can use and ask questions to support staff and other users of the software that might be experiencing the same issues as you, but have found fixes for them. So generally, there's really no great need for technical support. And there's also forums like Malware Tips that offer free malware removal advice and other tech tips. So if you are paying a lot of money in the hopes of getting advanced technical support and that's your main reason for paying for security software, it is something that maybe you should definitely reconsider. The third reason I wanted to focus on was the general user experience of using the software application. So this can mean a variety of things. So sometimes a really cheap antivirus might have a really crummy user interface and not only looks like it was drawn by a middle schooler, but can also be very difficult to navigate through some of the more advanced settings or they might not even exist at all. 
which can be a pretty big disappointment to someone like myself who likes to customize different security settings and features of a security product. I would definitely like to tweak some things around and I'm sure many of you who watch this video also like to do that as well. So sometimes antiviruses that appear to have a very high detection rate will also have a very high false positive rate. And now you may be asking yourselves, how does this fit into the user experience? Well, that means that you might receive regular pop-ups or alerts from the security software on your computer telling you that's flagging programs that are actually safe, but it doesn't have it in its whitelist. And a whitelist is basically how an antivirus keeps track of safe and malicious files. So a whitelist would be files that the antivirus has already scanned before and is deemed to be safe, so it's not going to question the user if you try and run a file like that. But with so many different programs out on the web nowadays, it's nearly impossible to whitelist all these programs quickly. So it could take months, weeks, or they might not ever be whitelisted if nobody makes a report about it. So sometimes these alerts can be very confusing, especially towards novice users. So if you're using a more advanced user interface, a lot of settings, you might get a lot of pop-ups. And some of these alerts can be very confusing for beginners or elderly users, I'm not trying to discriminate against our elderly, but just saying in the, some instances, false positives can even lead to critical Windows files to be deleted and the systems unable to boot. There are instances online that you could look up if you wanted more information about that, but it has happened in the past, even though that's a more extreme case. False positives happen every day, and if we get an alert from an antivirus saying something's malicious and it's really safe, that could be very dangerous to someone who just wants to go of whatever the antivirus recommends and doesn't know what it's actually deleting or quarantining. The fourth reason that there is no such thing as the best antivirus is the cost of the antivirus, anti-malware, or pretty much whatever security software you're using for your computer. While I will start focusing on the topic of paid software, this matter of cost does not only apply to paid shareware applications, but also to free products as well, and I'll explain about that in a minute. But starting with paid products, Often they will give so many licenses to the user for the duration of their license period. So typically I see three devices for a year or five devices for a year or two years. One, one device for one year is also pretty popular. Those are typically the more common ones that I've seen in the last five years or so. And if you own a licensed copy of an antivirus, it's probably something very similar to that. I have cleaned many clients' computers over the years and discovered that they have purchased three device protection or even up to five device licenses for one or two years, but they only have one or two computers that they are using this antivirus for. My theory about that is when people are persuaded to shift away from the flagship product and move towards more of a complete or deluxe edition of the software, they automatically get more licenses which end up going to waste. If you have unused licenses, they can often go entirely to waste. So when we start talking about close to the $100 range for all these licenses for each year, it starts adding up. And switching gears now to a free software discussion, the cost that people would incur from using these items would be the amount of banners or pop-ups that are nagging the user to purchase a premium edition of their software. So sometimes products will even have alerts telling the user that they are not fully protected and the only reasoning behind them not being fully protected is that they're not using the paid version of the software. So I know personally, if I opened up the user interface of my security software and saw red X marks and flashing banners, it would psychologically convince me that I'm not protected and should buy the product instead of using this obviously inferior free version if it's not good enough. So I would definitely factor in the cost of annoyance of all of these pop-ups and dealing with that into the cost of the product, even if the physical monetary amount is free. For the fifth reason, I wanted to focus on detection rate. 
I've stated it before, I believe detection rate is a rather poor indicator of an antivirus performance out in the real world on real computers and real hardware. Uh, the detection rate of all samples that exist out in the wild is unknown as there are new malware variants and new malware samples entirely being rolled out onto the internet every single day. So I don't understand how someone can full heartedly judge a product on its detection rate against let's say 200 threats when there are well over 2 million circulating online at any given time. So the sample size is not nearly large enough to pass the central limit theorem which if you haven't been brushed up in statistics for a while that so many samples of malware would be needed in order to make it representative of the entire population of malware that exists out in the wild. So and if the samples are ideally a proportional mix of the type of malware that exists out in the wild. It's impossible to do that because it's impossible to know the exact proportion of what type of malware exists out in the wild and as the population of malware is always growing and different types of malware go up and down in popularity it is really difficult to get a true representation of the entire population which is pretty much the point of what a detection test is but ultimately it leads to more confusion and harm than good. To round up the pack, um, number six are antivirus that incorporate another company's main engine into their own product. Well this one may be considered on the edge of what we're talking about best antivirus debunking if we are talking about the core antivirus itself. So if you're not aware, most of the big name antiviruses offer licenses to companies, so startups or other security companies that wish to improve their own detection rates will incorporate another engine's virus database and other technologies to improve their own product. So what most people don't realize is that if you look hard enough, some engines that you would have to pay for if purchasing through the manufacturer of the engine, you can actually get it for free through products that the engine has been licensed out to. However, it's important to note that the engine will likely not be as full featured and effective against malware than the original source. So even though Bitdefender, which is a great example of an engine that is licensed out to many security companies, just because you're getting the Bitdefender scanning engine does not mean you're getting the entire product with all the features that are bundled with it. So in that case, if you're using an antivirus that incorporates multiple scanning engines, it helps to reduce that disadvantage that you'd have by using a single replicated engine as some small security companies try and sell online or some of them actually give them away for free. Okay guys, so there we go. Uh, while I do not propagate this message on my own channel, I feel it's important to get this out there about there being this magical, mystical antivirus that can beat out all others. Unfortunately, there are other groups and people that continue to take advantage of people's perception of security products by making one product look superior because sometimes they throw, in my opinion, snake oil like actions into what are supposed to be helpful and informative videos. So this is one reason I try to avoid giving out my personal opinion as many people obviously ask me what security software I use as the security software that I use will be more than likely different than what would be needed for what my viewers would need as I really don't know their current setup, their system specifications, or their individual needs on their computer. So I hope I shed some light on this subject. Hopefully most of you have walked away more informed and ready to make personal decisions on what security software you would like to use and not just what someone behind a computer screen told you to do. So to answer the question, the best free antivirus is, is all of them, but at the same time, none of them. But it is important to keep in mind that some antiviruses are blamely better than others, but just generally speaking, to compare to antiviruses, it's just really unprofessional in my opinion. So anyway guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Take from it as you wish, and I always say take from it as you wish. You can check most of my videos at the end half, take from it as you wish, because I really, I would definitely recommend do your own investigation. That's why I prefer that you 
don't think that how it performs in this test is how it's going to perform on your computer. I just think of these reviews more as an idea of how a product would perform, but not definitely not a guarantee. So, like I said, take them as you wish, and I will talk to you later. Bye.